Welcome once again, and I'm so glad that you decided to join us for another Sermon in the Woods. I'm especially glad that my wife, Christina, could join today. And actually, Christina is going to be sharing a very special story, a first-person narrative. So she will be taking on the character of a Bible story. Well, I'm not going to tell you who she is. You'll have to figure that out. But before we get started, I'd like to invite you to bow your heads with me in a word of prayer. Kind and loving Father in heaven, Lord, thank you for bringing us to this beautiful and special place. Thank you for your word and for the opportunity that we have to learn. I pray now that you will open our minds as well as our hearts, that we may enter into this story, that it may become real to our hearts and lives today, and that we may grow closer to you and deeper in our faith. Is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, Christina, I can't wait to find out who you are and where you're going to take us in our story today. So let's explore the woods at the same time and dig into our Bibles and find out. All right, let's go. My name is My Little Lady, or My Princess. I grew up in a wealthy family, and we lived in a very developed urban town. It boasted beautiful city streets with neat rows of houses and some of the most learned and educated people in the area. We had all the comforts of life. I myself was well-educated and properly mannered. I was a very beautiful little girl and the pride and joy of my family. We were very proud of our heritage. Grandpa Shem made sure that we knew all about Adam, Seth, Enoch, and Methuselah. He told us what it was like to build the ark. My personal favorites were his firsthand accounts of caring for the animals while confined on a boat for a whole year. But he also told us many important things about our history. Things about the perfect world that God created, about the fall of Adam and Eve, and the promise of a Redeemer. Grandpa warned us about the wickedness and sin that were so bad that God had destroyed the earth with a flood. He shared about the importance of following God and listening to his voice. I laughed at the silliness of the Towers of Babel. It never pays to disobey God's orders. But there was one promise that I took very seriously. It was the promise that God made to Eve. He said to the serpent, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. Who had set us free from this bondage of sin? Her seed, a son of promise, a redeemer. And who knew when this son would be born? Could it be through me? Oh, how I longed for the day when I would hold my own son in my arms. All around our home was wickedness, even among our close relatives. So there weren't very many options for finding a husband who believed in God as I did. I was a beautiful young woman, so my family and I had to turn down many suitors. But there was one family member who I adored more than anyone else. He was everything a girl dreamed of, tall, handsome, kind, thoughtful, dark, and smart. Everyone loved him. He had 
an amazing business sense, and he was a very prosperous farmer. But what I admired the most was his devotion to God. He was different from the rest of our family. While the others were spending a holiday playing games or feasting together, he would go out and spend quiet time alone with God. He had a solid trust that I admired, and I often wished that I had half as much faith in God as he. So you can only imagine my surprise and joy to find out that he had chosen me for his wife. Oh, I was so honored. How wonderful it would be to worship the Lord together as a married couple, to be a sharer in his prayers and his faith in God, and to raise children together for the Lord, to hopefully, hopefully be in line for our coming Savior. Our wedding was a big affair. All our relatives came from miles around. Many friends and well-wishers came to shower us with their love. It was a fairy tale wedding better than any girl's dreams. We settled in a beautiful home on the outskirts of town so that we could be near the farm. Life settled into a glorious routine. <laughs> I remember standing outside our stone-built house looking over the fields and gardens and trees, just admiring the beautiful view. We had family close by. We had plenty of events going on, lots of things to do, and servants to help us with the farm work. The years flew by and life was amazing. I couldn't imagine anything better, except for one thing. I wasn't getting pregnant. I couldn't understand why. Was something wrong with me? Was God punishing me for something? Why couldn't I have children? I began to notice whispering behind my back at family events, people pointing in my direction and shaking their heads. Cold stares. Every time I walked in the room, I felt like I was being judged. I began to pray for a child, a son, Someone who could be our heir. Someone who would bring fulfillment into our life and laughter in our home. Our house seemed so empty and nothing was able to fill the deep longing in my heart. Who would take care of us when we got old? All I could do was pray. One morning, my husband returned from his morning walk looking very puzzled yet determined. You know that look that guys get sometimes. Well, I wasn't sure what to make of it. Maybe he was thinking about a new business proposition, perhaps? Maybe another family member was getting into trouble and he needed to talk to them. Whatever it was, it wasn't my place as a woman in that culture to ask too many questions. So I waited and wondered. You know how husbands are. Sometimes you just gotta wait a while it'll eventually come out. He seemed so much busier for the next few days. He was running errands, calculating business proposals, gathering supplies. <laughs> I was sure it was some new business venture that he was on. But one evening during supper, he interrupted my thoughts. My princess, he said solemnly, God has asked us to move away from here. I was in shock. Move? <laughs> Move away from all of our family and friends? <laughs> Move away from the only area I've ever known my entire life? Where will we live? What will we do? How long will we travel? Will we, will we be able to find as nice of a house as the one we live in? <laughs> my husband laughed as the questions came tumbling out of my mouth. Patience, my princess. Patience. His next words hit me like a bucket of cold water. The answer is, I don't know. What do you mean, I asked, you don't know? He answered, I mean that God didn't tell us where to go yet. He only asked us to leave here. We're just going to have faith that once we leave, he'll show us where to go next. 
But then he said something that made me sit straight up in my seat. God promised me that if we leave, he will make us into a great nation. Not only that, but through our seed shall all the families of the earth be blessed. I caught my breath. Through our seed? You mean God was promising us the same promise made to Eve? <laughs> my consternation at having to move was gone in an instant. My heart filled with joy. This was God's answer to our prayers. Oh, what a promise. Oh, what joy. We are going to have a son. I enthusiastically joined my husband in preparing for our departure. Selling things, purchasing supplies, making sturdy tents to live in, and getting ready for the most exciting adventure of my life. Saying goodbyes wasn't easy though. How do you explain to your relatives that you're moving away, but you don't know where you're going? That you're just blindly following God's leading with no idea what the end will be? How do you bear their taunts of ridicule at being childless, crazy, and throwing your life away? How do you respond to the well-wishers who try to convince you that your husband has lost his mind and you should just let him go on without you? Maybe a different husband would bring you more children. But that faith that I admired in my husband began to grow in my heart. I tried not to listen to the ideas of the family. Instead, I grasped the promise of God and trusted the end result into His capable hands. We left our comfortable home of convenience, our relatives, our educated townspeople, everything that was familiar, and set out into the wilderness. <laughs> Living in a tent took some getting used to. I'd grown up as a city girl. <laughs> But I took courage in seeing my husband's faith grow <laughs> and embarked on the longest camping trip of my entire life. As we entered the land of Canaan, God came to my husband again, this time with a promise that God would give this land to our descendants. <laughs> How I clung to that promise. Now that we were living in a big camp with all of our cattle, our servants, our household, I could observe my husband more. I saw his leadership among the others, how he patiently educated them all to believe in God. Every morning and every evening, he offered a sacrifice to God and led out in prayer and worship for our whole camp. My father and my nephew had also moved out with us. And my husband took such good care of them. Wow, I was so proud of him. Life resumed a new normal for us. It was different for sure. The people around us were nomadic tribes. We learned their ways. We had to find water and food for the livestock, and that meant picking up camp and moving locations often. But no matter where we went, my husband built an altar to the Lord. Morning and evening time with God were always a routine. But then came the famine. The grass dried up. Food was scarce. We didn't know what to do. We heard that there was food in Egypt. So we took our camp and headed that way. As we approached the borders of Egypt, my husband became very quiet. He looked disturbed which I hadn't really seen since that time when God first told him to move away from home. I just waited. I knew if I just waited patiently, he would say something eventually. And finally, 
he broke the silence. You are very beautiful, my princess, he gazed at me with admiring eyes. But then he shuddered. So beautiful, I fear they will take you away from me to become a wife of Pharaoh and then kill me. He paused as his fear began to fill my own heart. Will you please, he begged me, will you please tell everyone that you are my sister instead of my wife? That way they will spare my life. I don't want to be killed. It was my duty to obey my husband, but I sure didn't like the idea. I thought my husband had faith in God's protection. Why should I tell a lie to save his life? And what about my life? What would happen to me? It wasn't long before I found out just how serious that decision would be. All eyes were on us as we entered the land of Egypt, scrutinizing everything, inquiring, wanting to know everything about everything. Who are we? Where did we come from? Why are we here? And who was this beautiful woman standing out from all the rest of the camp? Is she marriageable? Everything happened so fast. I really don't know how it all took place. All I know is that one day I was living in a tent and the next day I was whisked away to Pharaoh's palace. After meeting the king, I was sent away to his special housing for all of his wives and concubines to go through special rituals that would prepare me to be his wife. I was horrified. What could I do? Where could I go? How could I escape this place? Would I ever see my family again? Would they kill my husband anyway? The servants, they, they did their best. They reassured me that because I was with Pharaoh, my family would be comfortable and well taken care of. The servants told me that my family had been given livestock, servants, and plenty of provisions. I consoled myself that at least I was doing my part to make sure our household had food to eat. But would I be here the rest of my life? There wasn't anything I could do except pray, and pray I did, and God answered those prayers. He sent plagues against Pharaoh. One plague after another came upon Pharaoh. It made him consult with his gods, his priests, and all of his wise men, and he finally realized that the only change that he had made was in taking me for his wife. So he brought me in before him and demanded that I tell him everything. I broke down and I told him the truth. I was married to my half-brother. Pharaoh was shocked. He immediately returned me to my family and ordered us to leave his country. I was so relieved to be with my family again, and I never wanted to see that place ever again. So many things happened over the years of our wanderings in Canaan. My husband and our nephew had a hard time keeping things separate when we were all together in one big camp, so we had to go in opposite directions. My nephew chose to go to the fertile valleys, closer to towns and civilizations. My husband took the wilderness area. I could tell my husband was really discouraged after our nephew left. I think he was secretly hoping that maybe our nephew could be his heir and that God would bless us through him. But once again, God was there. He was there in that trial, in that dark time in our lives when we thought there was no other hope. He came to my husband again. And this time he promised that all the land that we could see around us would be given to our descendants. And this time God added another promise that the descendants, our descendants, would be as many as the dust of the earth. Wow, that's a lot. 
Then we heard some terrible news. Our nephew and his household had been captured by the surrounding Canaanite kings. My husband fearlessly rounded up his own servants and formed his own army, marched out and rescued them from those kings. I spent so much time in prayer in my tent while my husband was fighting that battle. When he got back, he was victorious, thank God, but he seemed more discouraged than ever. I can't say I didn't feel some of sadness too. Neither of us were getting any younger. The years were going by. Our nephew was having lots of children, but they were not part of our household. We had no children. How was God supposed to give us descendants like the dust of the earth when we were childless? And then, right then, God came to my husband again. And this time, his promise got even bigger. First, God told my husband that our heir would come from my husband's own body. And then he said that our descendants would be as many as the stars of the sky. Wow. As my husband shared this with me, an idea struck me. God didn't say the children would come through me. They said they would come through my husband. What about a surrogate? My maid, she would be the perfect surrogate mother. I approached my husband with this idea. He was pretty hesitant at first, but I persisted. After all, it was a common practice for wealthy men to have a surrogate mother from one of their servants if their wife couldn't have children. This wasn't unusual at all. And besides, I don't know if you thought about this, but my husband was 86 years old and I was 76. Who heard of a 76 year old woman having kids anyway? It was a success. My maid got pregnant. We would have an heir. God's promise would finally be fulfilled. Oh, the joy that was in our household. But my life took a turn for the worse. My maid became arrogant towards me. She used her status as surrogate mother to the heir as a reason to refuse to do her work and treat me with contempt because I was a childless failure. In tears, I fled to my husband. He listened to my complaints, but he didn't want to be responsible for doing anything to his heir. So he just told me to do what I thought best. So I did. I punished my maid. Not enough to cause a miscarriage. No, this baby was really important. But just enough for her to realize who was the boss around here. But that backfired again. She ran away into the wilderness. So now we had peace and quiet. But we were worried about her life. And the life of her baby. Our baby. Out in the wilderness all alone with no food and no water. But God intervened and spared her life. <laughs> and he talked some sense into her too. She came back a somewhat more submissive maid. The baby was born, and you couldn't have seen a prouder dad than my husband. Finally, at long last, a healthy baby boy, an heir, a child of promise. My husband named him God Has Heard. Yes, God truly had heard our affliction and answered our prayers. Thirteen years later, God came to my husband again with a promise. 
even more detailed than the last promise. I guess I haven't told you our names yet, although I'm sure you guessed them a long time ago. My husband is Abram, meaning exalted father. My name is Sarai, meaning my princess. It was an endearing name, kind of like you would say, my little girl or my sweetie. But now God changed both of our names. My husband became Abraham, meaning father of a multitude. My name became Sarah, meaning noble woman, princess, or queen. Definitely an increase of status from my princess. Then God told my husband that I would have a son. My husband told God that Ishmael was already born and he was our heir. But God said, no, Ishmael will be great too, but your heir will come through your wife. My husband was so shocked, he wasn't sure what to think. He downplayed it significantly when he told me, and he and I both brushed it off. Ishmael was our heir. There was nothing to be concerned about. I didn't complain about the name change, though. I rather liked the respect that it gave me. Not too long after this encounter, some strangers came passing through our area. True to his habit, my husband followed after them and persuaded them to stop for food. We lived in the wilderness in the middle of nowhere, and there weren't very many provisions anywhere nearby. He always tried to make sure that people were well stocked with supplies when they passed our way. He hated the thought of someone potentially starving to death. So he succeeded and they came to our home and my husband and I began preparing a meal for them. I was keeping my polite distance. So I was actually sitting in my tent by the door, listening to every word being spoken as our guests were eating. Imagine my shock when one of them suddenly said in a very loud voice, where is Sarah, your wife? Sarah? My name had just been changed. How did they know my new name? Who were these people? But his next words were even more shocking. Your wife, he said, will get pregnant and in nine months you will have a son. I was keeping quiet as a mouse, but I couldn't help chuckling quietly to myself. What does this guy know? I'm way too old to have a child. Suddenly, the voice interrupted my thoughts. Why did Sarah laugh, saying she is too old? I didn't even think about how rude I was. The words just kind of came tumbling out of my mouth before I could stop them. I was so afraid. I didn't laugh! But the voice came back again. Yes, you did laugh, and you will have a son in nine months. Shock. Fear, joy, consternation, excitement. <laughs> I didn't know you could experience all those feelings at the same time. Could it be true? Would I really have a son of my own in my old age? Could I really get pregnant at 90 years of age? But yes, I really did get pregnant. And nine months later, I gave birth to a healthy baby boy. And did I ever laugh? I laughed for joy. I laughed at the weird looks that everyone gave me when they heard he wasn't my grandson. So I named him Isaac, meaning laughter. God had heard me in my laughter and made me laugh. And everyone laughed with me. I was finally a mother.
oh, if I had time, there's so much more I could tell you about watching the fire and smoke from Sodom rising in the morning sky, wondering if Lot and any of his family made it out alive about dealing with the jealousy of my maid and her son Ishmael, because we now had an heir of our own, about the pain my husband went through because I demanded that he send them away, banishing his own son from our household, <laughs> about telling King Abimelech that I was Abraham's sister because we hadn't learned our lesson the first time, how God had to intervene by appearing to Abimelech in a dream to tell him to let me go. About the wonderful years of raising Isaac to love and serve them fear the Lord. <laughs> and about the shock when Isaac and Abraham came back from worshiping on a mountain only to tell me that God had asked my husband to offer my only son as a burnt offering and God had spared his life at the last second. No wonder they didn't tell me goodbye before they left. As I look back on my journey to motherhood, a 90 year journey of faith, I feel so unworthy to be chosen by God. I feel like my life was one of laughter, laughing at God, trying to help him out, not being patient, messing everything up and just making a disaster of everything. But yet God was so patient, so forgiving, so loving, <laughs> and yes, he got the last laugh. But most importantly, God kept every one of his promises. Look for yourself. Abraham's seed is as many as the dust of the ground or the stars of the sky. God did make a great nation out of him. And that promise that was made to Adam and Eve and re-given to Abraham before we started that journey of a lifetime was fulfilled. The seed of the Redeemer came through me. And when I am raised to life on that resurrection day and see my Jesus face to face, I know one thing for certain, we will laugh together for joy. In Zephaniah 3.17, it says, The Lord your God in your midst, the Mighty One, will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you with his love. He will rejoice over you with singing. Mothers, whether you are mothers by blood or spiritual mothers in the faith, I just want to encourage you, don't give up. You may not see light at the end of the tunnel. Your way may seem hard or you may make a grand mess of things, but don't be discouraged. My Savior is your Savior too. He loves you. He loves your children and he will walk you through life. There will be times that you will laugh at him, that you will tell him that he's crazy. But if you place your hand in his and walk with him, he will make you laugh for joy. Psalm 126 says, Then was our mouth filled with laughter, and our tongue was singing. Then said they among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us, and we are glad. Those who sow in tears shall reap in joy. He who continually goes forth weeping, bearing seed for sowing, 
shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. What about you? Will you place your hand in his? Whether you are a mother or just simply a child of God, he has a plan for you. Sometimes it means patiently waiting. Sometimes it means trials or pain, but he will never leave your side and he will see you through and you will laugh for joy at the end. Are you willing to trust him? Are you willing to hold his hand? I can assure you that you will never regret it. Let's pray. Our precious heavenly father, we thank you that you are ever by our side. We thank you that you are willing to hold our hand, that you love us and you care for us. And even when we don't understand, when the way seems hard, when it seems like we're waiting so long, you have a plan and you are there and you care. We love you, Lord. And we just ask you right now that you will hold our hand that we will never let go of you, that you will stay by our side and that we may very soon laugh for joy with you in your kingdom. We love you. We thank you for this. And we ask this now in Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>